Welcome to CNN Money Switzerland, you're watching On The Block. Today, I am at the OECD headquarters in Paris to attend a blockchain conference held by the organization. And from infrastructure to mobility, to healthcare, to intellectual property, many topics and many use cases were discussed here, both by politician, institution heads and startup founders. I had the chance to meet some of them. Intellectual property is such a Swiss topic. We have the WIPO uh, in, in Geneva. Why is blockchain uh, necessary to, to have a better um, protection when it comes to intellectual pro uh, property? Well, WIPO is a good, uh, you know, a good first thing that you mentioned because we are actually in a partnership with WIPO. So they are harmonizing global regulations for intellectual property and they are very much aware of what blockchain can do. Essentially, it's a decentralized, secure ledger. If you would have to explain it in very simple terms, you could say it's a more safe way, you know, of, of crowd uh, um, uh, protecting things so it's, it's cloud storage and crowd storage all in one it's pretty interesting and and the, the idea behind it is that whenever you have intellectual property what's really important is to show that you have had an idea first that you have been in possession of something uh, at the first person so um, we can provide exactly that proof with blockchain technology because it has some notary-like characteristics. So we store information there and you can use that in proof, uh, as proof in court or when you're talking to patent offices. And what clients could you potentially have? What, what sector could, uh, could use blockchain, this blockchain-based intellectual property for their business? Well, naturally, we are, of course, talking to all the big clients around the world, the corporates that really create intellectual property. So they're easy to identify. Sometimes it's tech uh, conglomerates, but uh, also a lot of pharmaceutical companies, which you have a lot of, of course, uh, in Switzerland. But we're also talking to a number of the, the top universities worldwide because they are producing a lot of intellectual property that they need to take care of. And our platform can also help with the organization of these steps or having different user rights, having a secure place to store that information, the possibility to safely share that with others, maybe um, other companies that they work with or other universities, and also then to monetize that by selling and licensing intellectual property. And the static point was you when you worked in, in pharma and you felt the need to, to protect and to prove that you were the first in developing a new drug or a new treatment. Yeah, that's right. So uh, I was active in a pharmaceutical company and of course there's a lot of intellectual property that that's gets created that you need to protect and we were looking into new ways how to make that you know more easily possible for us and we came across intellectual property and blockchain as an idea and nobody seemed to be doing that and that was the uh, the moment when the idea was born and blockchain it's this new technology that everyone talks about but not necessarily really understand how it works um, does the, the, the backup, the partnership that you have with WIPO, for instance, uh, help you prove your potential clients that you're legit? Uh, yes, of course, you're right. There are people out there that still have a problem understanding the concept of what a blockchain really is, which is complicated. Uh, and then there are those who are skeptical of it. As a technology, maybe not so much, but of many of this, uh, the use cases that are promoted. And I think I, I have to agree that Blockchain is not a solution for every industry or for every use case, but in terms of intellectual property, um, it was interesting for me to find out that the players in that field are really open towards the idea. So it doesn't necessarily mean that we have to talk people into believing that blockchain could change things here. So there is and has been a recent article in the WIPO magazine called IP and Blockchain, a match made in crypto heaven. So that shows you that the, this, this sector is actually waiting for solution that can help them uh, and they already decided blockchain should be part of that solution. So what you offer is some kind of a very secured cloud to, to, to prove and store your patterns, your intellectual property, while at the same time many people say that blockchain isn't that safe and hacks can still happen. How do you secure this and how do you offer this guarantee to your clients? 
Well, the platform that we are offering essentially is an open platform. You will only need your browser to access it. It will be free to register, so we make it as easy as possible for you to onboard and then take a look at it for yourself and see, okay, which of these services that we offer on that platform could be interesting to you. So uh, it's something that caters, I think, to the needs of universities, big companies, but also to artists, because also as an artist, if you have copyrights in order to defend them in court, you you need proof that you have been in the possession of your work as the first person, as proof that you are the actual author. Uh, we can provide all that. So uh, when it comes to security, you will of course have to and to see okay which aspects of what we are doing are essentially you know have to be secure. So yes, you can store your intellectual property also in a draft mode with us. Can work on the platform. I think we have a very secure setup and architecture. Uh, but if you don't want to do that, and simply say, okay, we leave that on our service. We only use Vaultitude to actually release that information to the public, thereby ensuring I have proof of authorship or make a defensive publication. Um, then you will find that blockchain is, is very secure here because essentially we are using a public blockchain. We are using the Ethereum blockchain, which is very trusted. And uh, to be honest, the main, uh, the main critic Points, points of critique here are that it could slow down at some point, which is not an issue when it comes to IP protection. Because if you have to wait for a cup of coffee and, and you know for paying that for three minutes, that could be a huge issue. But if you want to protect your IP and you have to wait three minutes, I don't think that any uh, you know legal department would care about that. So. Um, I hear the critics and of course, yes, we are agnostic as in, in blockchain terms, meaning we could switch to a more suitable open blockchain anytime. But right now, I think we have a very secure um, architecture that we are always very happy you know, to share with clients and explain. So, so far, there has been no criticism that, that needed us you know, to change and rethink how we are building this thing. Every day is a struggle for SME owner. And if you go to emerging markets, it's about survival. When you uh, wake up in the morning, you need to find a way to make uh, some kind of a deal, whether it is to sell you know, food uh, on, in the food market or whether it is uh, uh, to go online and to try to convince someone to buy your products. So this type of population has very specific needs that cannot be really targeted uh, by large corporates, ERP systems, uh, because you need agility, you need flexibility, and at the same point, you need to target the three key pain points, digital identification, digital documents, and digital payment means. In some countries, SMEs cannot participate because there is no way they can get access to a bank account. In some countries, like Indonesia, it takes three years after uh, being set up that the business gets properly registered, so they don't exist. And with blockchain, how does this change? So with blockchain, we are creating uh, an entire system which can give them access to who they are because it's sent on the blockchain. So you can demonstrate with a proof of trust mechanism that uh, you have been properly incorporated or this is you and your business and you have established uh, already uh, transactions with other companies. You can definitely demonstrate uh, your supply chain so from the very initiation of a purchase order, when you agree with someone else, to the population of invoice and to the perfection of payments, you can show your successful transactions. Right now, if you have no ERP systems, it's just like bringing 20 kilos of documents uh, to a bank that will not look at it. And then this is uh, what needs to be done to access financing, because as a SME, you don't have any data about yourself unless you're dig properly digital. And this data may not, be, uh, may, not, may not be trustful because it's not recorded anywhere. And there is not a sufficient proof of trust mechanism for recording. So guess what? If you put SMEs on the platform system when they can run their transactions, the backend will gather the data. They will be identifiable. They will be known as a good supplier or as a good seller. And then they can provide this evidence to financing institutions. The financing institution will be able to check whether invoices produced for financing has not been tempered, is, uh, is related to a real transaction because you can see the counterparty on the platform and you can give access in one hash uh, of six months, nine months of transactions. You are visible, you are traceable, 
you're identifiable and you can give access to your data for the, the good, to produce data or identification about yourself. And this is with really what is lacking for SME development and access to financing. You talk a lot about emerging markets, you're based in Singapore, but is there any other places in the world or the markets that uh, your, your strategy, your system could be applied? So we designed the system using Singapore as an example and we want to make it succeed because Singapore has two nice features. It's a fintech hub and they are pushing for fintech solutions, but it's also one of the largest trade hub. It's about 600 billion of import and exports every year. Um, it's also at the center of uh, very interesting markets who, are, uh, who used to be emerging markets, now they are growing markets. So if you look at Indonesia, 260 million people, if you look at uh, Malaysia, the Philippines, we can uh, definitely address them with the same protocol, with the same program. Our protocol was designed for everyone to be able to participate and essentially you don't need to be financially literate to use it. So yes, we can push the program on uh, the Indonesian markets, we can push the program on uh, African markets and we also want to promote women-led businesses because most of the time in emerging markets women have a key role in providing revenues to the family and they are the ones uh, waking up early in the morning and being connected to these platforms to try to make trade and to find uh, buyers for their products. So we really want to support also this part of the economy that is led by women in emerging markets. Why is it so important to take care of healthcare data? Well, health and health data, um, if you think of health from a, from a bigger perspective, it, it impacts everybody on the planet, no matter how old you are uh, or your social economic conditions. And you know, the next wave of health is really going to be all about health access and data and access to data is really going to enable a whole, a whole new set of health, health related services. At the same time, this is super sensitive data that people don't want to have their health uh, data on the cloud uh, accessible to basically everyone. How do you deal with that? Well, I think it's very important that a person own and control their data uh, and be able to determine who can see it, um, how, they, how somebody can use that, use that data, and eventually be able to monetize their own data. So I think we have to put the control back in, into the person's hands and, and allow them to use their data to live a healthier life uh, without, with, with all the uh, confidence that it's safe and secure. And what is the advantage of using blockchain technology uh, in that field? Well, I think from a bigger perspective, it puts the power back in the hands of the person and really helps create this whole person-centric health model. Uh, I think we're standing um, on, the, on the frontier of a whole new generation of health services, one that's really tailored to the person based on your genome and how your body's working versus you know, just a profile. I'm a middle-aged middle -aged man, so I'm gonna be treated this way. It really begins to let it, uh, allow us to begin to tailor around a person based on their, their, who they are and, and the data about themselves. And for the patient, um, what is the positive aspect they can have from a, a blockchain healthcare higher health data? Well, you know, over the course of our lifetime, no matter where you live, you're going to see maybe up to 16 doctors. And so your data lives in all, all these places. What, you know, having access to that, that data gives you um, a longitudinal view of who you are and how you've been living, but also lets you let you present that data to you, to your doctor or to your care provider in a way that's more meaningful, that lets them deal with who you are um, as a person and, and the specific uh, uniqueness about yourself. So that means less risk of, of problem in surgery with former treatments? And yeah, a whole lot less risk. Well, let's take one example, which is um, particularly our elderly population over half are probably on a set of um, set of medications that contradict each other or they shouldn't be on that combination of medications. By understanding their, their whole genome profile allows, allows the doctor to really tailor the dosage and type of medication to the person themselves. And what are the trends?